Okay. Um, all right. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, in Zoom, um, uh, as well as um my um cohort in the room. So I'm going to give the floor now to Dondi, who will be officially moderating today's session. Uh, thank you, Erica. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session of the CPS and Environment Research Network Dialogues for 2023. I am Don Di Ramos, a PhD student at the School of Arts and Humanities, Australian Catholic University. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the unceded and stolen lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. For those of you joining us for the first time, the CPS and Environment Research Network is a gathering of postgraduate scholars, PhD candidates, postdocs, and lecturers who are primarily based in Australian universities with research in the juncture of urbanization, the built environment, climate change and disaster, public act, learning environments, informality, and allied fields as they relate to the Philippine and Filipino context. For the discussion, we'd like to request everyone to turn off their video cameras and to keep their audio muted in order to preserve bandwidth and to ensure that the presentations are given without destruction. You may also use the chat function to type in your comments or if you have uh, to communicate something to the moderator. Uh, during the Q&A, please use the raise hand function uh, and we will acknowledge you. You may turn on your video and uh, audio to uh, post your question, but if you're experiencing technical problems, you may also use the chat function instead. The webinar is scheduled to last for approximately two hours, with each of our speakers presenting for approximately 20 to 30 minutes, after which we will give time for questions. We may extend for a limited time should we need to accommodate more questions afterward. Okay. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker for this afternoon. Uh, our first speaker is Maxine Chan. Maxine is currently a PhD candidate researching on residential building decarbonization under the Department of Infrastructure Engineering at the University of Melbourne. Her expertise in this field is driven by more than five years of, of experience in research projects focusing on the energy industry and sustainability in the built environment. As an energy engineer, she has been involved in building developments for the private sector, technical advising for government bodies, and academic research for sustainable energy systems. She has also pushed for research geared towards marginalized sectors within the building sector through her works in energy consumption modeling for Philippine socialized housing, developing clean energy transition pathways, and solar electrification for rural and island communities. Maxine's talk is entitled Decarbonizing the Residential Sector, the Residential Building Sector, a Multi-Scale Life Cycle Approach. Um, Maxine, um, um, the, uh, I'll read the abstract. The residential building sector contributes significantly to global emissions, which in turn is expected to rise along with continuing population growth and rapid urbanization. For the Philippines, in particular, the residential sector accounted for approximately 26% of overall energy consumption. Given this, there is a subsequent need to implement energy efficiency measures to reduce power usage, energy costs, and greenhouse gas emissions. By analyzing household power consumption, a baseline energy performance model of a representative standardized socialized housing low-rise low building was developed. This served as a tool to compare various scenarios that implemented technical solutions and household occupancy behavior. From the baseline model, it was shown that the appliances that were used the most would be the televisions, light bulbs, and electric fans, regardless of household typology, amounting to around 21% and 35% of total electricity use. The overall energy consumption of the representative building was determined to have an energy usage intensity of 28.57 kilowatt hour square meter per year, considering 100 household units as well as the common facilities. In terms of a per household value, the average power usage amounted to 79.2 kilowatt hour per month. And for the scenarios, it was recommended that lead light bulbs would be used to reduce energy costs. Um, to uh, present her paper, 
let us all give a virtual round of applause to Ms. Maxine Chang. <laughs> and so, hi, thank you, everyone. Um, so actually, uh, <clears throat> so in the abstract that I sent over was focused more on my, what I did during my master's. Yeah. But so right now, I think I'll just uh, provide more for them doing here and then how it relates to the socialized housing context. In the so right now, uh, I research on residential sector decarbonization, particularly for the Victoria, the state of Victoria. But then it can also be uh, scaled down to LGA level as well as looking at uh, the individual aspects. Uh, so like simulation that so wait, I'll just share my screen. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So yeah, uh so so my thesis research really focuses on um going beyond energy consumption. So it's like decarbonization, but based on uh, energy use of let's say the residential sector. So um what we scale life cycle load should be like um scaling across jurisdictions and also looking at the individual level. Then life cycle would mean uh, looking at um energy from both the operating, uh, like when the house is being used, and when the house is being built. So more or less in that sense. So here, like where's where's carbon in buildings, right? So usually when you think about um uh carbon emissions in the built environment, you would think about how we use the energy like right now, like at, at operation. But it's important to include uh, when it's actually being built because, uh, <laughs> all right, uh, it's important to look into what happens before that because when we actually build the house, we already miss a lot of um, carbon in the air. So that's, that's something to consider when you look at the carbonization policies. So here's just a brief overview of uh, the building and construction, looking at the global energy and corresponding greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see here that around 36% is uh, from the built environment, particularly here, there's like most of it would be from the residential sector. Then uh, looking at the emissions component, uh, a lot of that would also be from the residential sector. But then uh, what, the, what does this account for? So usually it looks into the operating, but we should also consider the emissions from, yes, from the build, building of the materials, from the construction, and even up to demolition. So look within the Australian context, um, the building uh, and construction sector comprises around 25% of the annual carbon emissions. So looking at the residential and housing sector, these are just some characteristics. So uh, actually the residential sector comprises more uh, emissions compared to commercial buildings. And then um, currently the policies in place to uh, manage this would be mandatory schemes for let's say new homes. So uh, the nat hers rating is uh, a house, a house rating system based on energy performance. So the higher the star rating, the more energy efficient your house is. So um, the mandate right now is uh, for new homes, it should at least be seven star out of 10. So it's pretty high, but then usually that considers just the uh, heating and cooling um, components in the house. And then for let's say uh, existing buildings, which is a uh, a big issue that you should look into as well because most of the stock right now would because like buildings have a long lifespan so like when you build a house it would last for at least 50 years so um you kind of lock in that um those, those emissions already and here in victoria there are very many uh buildings built prior to 1990 so like uh right now at, in place there'll be voluntary policies to try to manage the energy consumption there but then on the other side of the coin, of course, like I think compared to commercial buildings, residential buildings have more socioeconomic influences because like, of course, households live there in a varying um, socioeconomic uh, uh, statuses. So like uh, you can see that there's a heterogeneity when it comes to household use. So it's harder to kind of um, predict what uh, how they use their energy compared to let's say a commercial building where uh, there's like a office schedule set so uh, it is said to have like a SME cottage type industry when it comes to uh, adapting green building initiatives. And so here you can see that stakeholders have a large role in uh, influencing the residential sector, particularly households. 
So uh, from here, you can see the gap. So the first one focuses more on the physical aspect of despite the share increasing share of embodied uh, carbon, because with more energy efficient homes, let's say you'd have more insulation, all these things, as well as the increasing population growth. So there's a, a larger need for more homes. So you can kind of uh, expect that the embodied carbon would increase in share as well compared to operation. So uh, despite this, the policies main, uh, mainly focus on operational carbon at the moment. And also, it's also difficult to decide on the appropriate intervention scheme, like which would be more um, equitable and like which uh, what would what would households more more likely adapt to um, um, in, uh, within the sector. So, <clears throat> so just to show like the methodology of the whole thing. So, uh, for this uh, this study focuses on using a bottom up typological approach. So using typologies, so like, uh, let's say the star rating of the homes as well as the housing type, whether if it's detached or semi-detached, then the type of construction materials used as well, because let's say, for example, brick veneer would incur more carbon emissions compared to timber homes, then that would be utilized into, uh, like using a, 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 sorry, a, a database for construction materials so that can estimate the embodied carbon, but then also using uh, simu building simulation tools to uh, to simulate the, the energy consumption for homes. So in this case, it's just focusing on heating and cooling because those are the ones um, uh, those are the ones that consume, uh, contribute the most when it comes to uh, operational emissions. And also those are the ones that are influenced in terms of let's say locational um, context and all those things. So that, so you have like the individual level, then that can be expanded to stock level, like uh, LGA wide and even statewide. Then, so that, uh, that has then the whole life carbon emissions. But then the other side of the coin, you have to put the people aspect as well. So you have, um, you have the building stock model. So just, um, physical things, and then you have the households. So utilizing the same um, methodology, like the typological level. So using, let's say, uh, socioeconomic attributes like household income and the structure of the household, whether they're single or couple or something like that. And then uh, that yields occupancy profiles, which uh, would influence, let's say, how much time they spend in the home would influence how much energy would be used. Then uh, actually, the, it would also look into household decisions. And for example, tenure status, if a household were to own or to rent their homes, would they be, that would uh, predetermine whether they would, let's say, change their heating system to something more uh, sustainable or something like this. Or also, it could lead to if, let's say, uh, I, I would want to renovate my home to be more uh, thermally comfortable. So that those things would then come into play, which would then have like a whole life carbon emissions plus the influence of household decisions. So uh, all of those would then yield to, let's say, um, scenario, uh, analyzing different scenarios. So like, uh, let's say looking at the different LGAs and then how all these factors would come into play and then how it would uh, lead into different scenarios. So like, for example, uh, considering different um, situations, let's say, what if the grid would be um, all renewables, then how would that impact the carbon emissions for the residential sector? Or let's say, for example, I think right now there's like a housing crisis as well. So like, let's say you try to make, um, try to build more like uh, vertical, like vertical development. So how would that then impact um, carbon emissions? So, uh, so far at the moment, <laughs> Uh, I would uh, I would have like um, initial data on let's say the building stock, <coughs> sorry the building stock model. So it's divided into like existing, new, and renovating households. So uh, actually you can see let's say from existing to new. So uh, there's a shift in terms of uh, let's say initially for uh, existing homes, heating would comprise more of the space conditioning. But then there's like a shift towards cooling uh, cooling load. And then here for renovated, because like uh, most of the homes prior to like 2006, uh, it was mainly just heating, like it, it wasn't mandatory to install like a cooling system there. 
So um, it's important to note that Victoria is mainly at, uh, mainly powered by gas. So like, and considering that most of the homes are uh, prior to 1990, so it's a very gas uh, gas dominated in terms of uh, space conditioning. So, but then you can see here, let's say for operating carbon, it's around let's say 30 uh, kg CO two e, so like kilogram. Uh, like just like the unit for carbon emissions. But then when you consider the embodied carbon, it actually has like much more when you build a home. So like uh, the initial carbon is a lot, especially when you build new, because uh, here the, the trend is that homes are getting bigger, the average uh, house size. So even so you think about, even if for example, the, you put the mandatory policy of uh, let's say a seven star home, but then houses are getting bigger, so you use more construction materials, which would then lead to more um, embodied carbon. Uh, so, so there's the the issue there. But then you can see that uh, with renovation, um, you, it you can sharply reduce your, the materials that you use compared to when you build build from scratch, build new. But you can't really say that we shouldn't build new at all because there's also a, po a population growth. So there's those things to think about. And then uh, looking at, let's say, uh, projecting it to 2050. So you can see that uh, even if you have uh, a mandatory policy for new homes to have like this minimum standard, uh, the increase in population growth is expected to, it's, it's pretty sharp. So it's expected to still grow in emissions. Then uh, consequently, that would also happen with embodied carbon. So that's that's something to consider in terms of um, estimation of uh, whole life carbon. Yeah, okay, and then so here, uh, just to look at the other side of the coin. So you can see that um, with the stakeholders in play are uh, usually like the government, the non-household stakeholders like industry, and in this case, households because this is the residential sector. So you have like various different uh, decisions. So like maintenance, renovation, um, a heat and cooling settings, op occupancy profiles, then how it would influence uh, either embodied carbon or operational carbon. So you can see that um, most of, let's say, a household decision would influence directly how the home is being operated. But then, like for example, uh, the choice to renovate would actually also uh, impact the embodied component as well. <clears throat> this would then... Uh, kind of interlink with, let's say, government action in, in terms of uh, when, let's say, uh, in terms of policy making, when you see like how the household would move in, in terms of their decision making and how it would impact uh, carbon emissions, then it's possible that uh, the corresponding policies can be implemented here as shown in this uh, diagram, which would then um, influence how non-household stakeholders or more industry players would act upon that so yes and then here this is just to show that um these are just different lgas and then there are different uh, values of let's say um distributions of whether a household would own or rent and what particular type of house housing typology whether detached or semi-detached so you can just see it really differs across different lgas so of course because of different uh social economic mixtures uh, per lga so this is just to show those things, which then would also influence, let's say, their choices in heating system, whether they were lean more towards gas or electric. And then that would then lead to, let's say, uh, its effect on operational carbon. So you can see that there are some um, there are some who are more inclined to use, let's say, an electric heater, and then depending on, let's say, various triggers. So let's say if you were to reduce electric heating costs, then likely these types of households can lean towards adapt uh, changing or things like that. But yes, so it, it it just differs per LGA. So if you want to look at, let's say, more localized um, policies, you can kind of um, extract that component and just look at it at an LGA level. So yeah, just mark those things. So like um, to relate it, to go back to the Philippine context. So uh, actually what, what I'm doing right now in the PhD is kind of like an expansion from what I did in my uh, master's thesis. So uh, as mentioned in the abstract, so uh, in the Philippines, I worked on socialized housing in particular, 
and more of energy consumption rather than decarbonization. So like uh, my goal that time was more of to provide a profile for socialized housing uh, residents because like at least with a profile, you can try to look for different solutions and at least you, you, you can kind of know, oh, this is how much they consume. So um, as mentioned, it was around 28 kilowatt per hour per square meter. Then, um, yeah, but anyway, the context here is like for socialized housing, um, the housing costs, um, let's say around lower than four, uh, four, 400,000 pesos, if I'm not mistaken, then uh, a household there would earn less than 10,000 a month. And, but then their electricity cost would be around 7%. So it's still, it's, I think from from before, like, I think this is like the third, like the, it would be food, then housing costs, and then electricity, but then still like a significant amount. Uh, so it was, that was like more of the, um, the, 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 what drove that study. And then, uh, so you can see there are some elements of that study and, what I'm doing right now. So here you can see a uh, a a uh, a model of a socialized housing uh, tenement. Uh, so the site here was in Paradise Heights in Smoky Mountain, and then you can see that there are like uh, household typologies depending on the number of people as well as uh, percentage of employment and uh, range of kilowatt hour consumption. Then here it's just to highlight the usage. So you can see that most of them would use uh, television light bulbs and fans. But then you can see, let's say for the refrigerator, like um, across homes, there are some who leave the refrigerators the whole 24 hours. But then a lot of, most of them would then just turn it on at a certain number of time, maybe like for two hours and then they shut it off. That's why the, the, average, uh, the average consumption is lower here. So yeah, like, so just to summarize, so in terms of um, space cooling, the, there's the shift from heating to cooling, as well as the importance of embodied carbon and looking into renovation as a possible policy thing. Uh, then of course, the, import, the influence of households as key players that would drive uh, carb, uh, decarbonization policies. And then looking at various other socioeconomic decisions and factors like tenure status and occupancy profiles. So this whole thing is basically just to provide a more granular framework. So this could hopefully lead to better estimates of carbon emissions and more likely decarbonization policies to um, for possibly to achieve net zero or things like that. Um, then yes, this is more or less just what I mentioned earlier. So though the focus is on Victoria, Australia, but the methodology can be adapted to different contexts, let's say the Philippines and possibly even different subcontexts of all of those things. So yeah, thank you so much. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you for that interesting lecture, Maxine, on decarbonization and how has uh, household decisions and then uh, household stakeholders such as the government uh, such as government actions affect carbon uh, emissions and the carbonization of household uh, residential households. So I have a question, but we'll reserve it for later. And for our participants, um, you may you may send in your question using the chat uh, function of Zoom. Um, so we'll now proceed to our second speaker. Our next speaker is Ian Rafael Ramirez. Uh, Day Sha is an early career theater performance and cultural studies scholar, an emerging queer artist, and a 24 year old stunner. Their yeah. <laughs> essay on the Day X Future, a popular queer space in Cubao, appeared in the Australasian Drama Studies Journal. They are currently a PhD candidate at the University of Melbourne where they are doing research with self-proclaimed and publicly held baklang panels to make sense of the different relations that inform the assemblage of their world-making practices. Their talk, entitled, Dito Ba Ang Sulok Kung Takda? Kimi, the spatial temporal productions of the baklang canal. So through a close examination of Carlo Paolo Pacolor's brujas and cookies in pans nang maglublub ako sa isang mangkok ng liwanan, um, their work in progress presentation will address the question, when does the Baklang Canal erupt? 
And they will argue that the spatiotemporal productions of the Baklang Canal and not uh, the, the Baklang Canal and not the project of making and unmaking. So let us give um, Ian a big round of applause. And I will turn the floor to Ian. I believe tao ito. <laughs> I believe si Gemma. <laughs> um, maraming salamat, Don B. At um, salamat din, Max. Salamat, uh, salamat din, Erica, at sa CERN sa um, pag-imbita na uh, magbahagi ngayong araw. Um, ayun. So before I also officially start my presentation, I would first like to acknowledge that we are gathering today um, on stolen lands in the unceded territories of the Wurundjeri, Wurundjeri peoples of the mighty, mighty Kulin nations. And I also pay my respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Sovereignty has never been ceded. This was always will be Aboriginal land. Yeah. So let's let's begin. Yes. So my thesis maps the assemblage of the world-making practices employed by the Baklang Canal, a local gendered and class social category in the Philippines, stereotypically associated with um, largely being unrespectable. The Bakla is a local gender identity and is also a Tagalog construction that is elusive and often escapes characterization. But it is nonetheless conflated with effeminacy, gayness, trans femininity, and sometimes transgenderism. It was, however, reclaimed, Baklang Canal um, was reclaimed from its pejorative deployment to mean warriors of social justice by queer progressives on Twitter during November 2020 at the height of COVID 19 um, pandemic in the Philippines, whom I posit possibly reclaimed the term due to being confronted by their own middle class positions and elitism towards the lumpen bakla. So what I will present today is an excerpt from um, the first draft of my analytical chapters that I'm currently developing, and it's titled um, The Spatial Temporal Productions of Baklang Canal Fabulations. Dito ba ang solo contact ba? Kimi. <laughs> so my point of departure in this chapter is a question that Carlo Paolo Pacolor posed to me during one of our earlier conversations. When does the Baklang Canal erupt? Kailan nga ba box? Or I can also extend this by asking, how does the Baklang Canal create ephemeral spaces that accommodate their canalness or being canal? So I will focus on a close examination of two creative works. One is Brujas, um, the image on the left, a play by Carlo Paolo Pacolor about a coven of witches on the run and is loosely based on Isabella de los Reyes' El Diablo in Filipinas. Ang Diablo sa Pilipinas. The other is Cookies in Ampan's short film, Nang Magluglub Ako sa Isang Mangkok ng Diwanan. Both creative works blur the linear narrative form by playing with temporalities and spatialities. Brujas cuts across time and space, and its performance was held across Metro Manila, transforming the city into their stage. Meanwhile, Nang Magluglub is a film about two friends and their dog named Kitty navigating social isolation in the time of COVID-19 through queer joy. Now this film plays with the ways in which we sense space, time, in particular, the dwelling of the Baklang Canal. I posit that these two creative works illuminate the project of making and unmaking, period. <laughs> through enmeshing the questions of the spatial with the temporal, they engage in the conversation of when might the Baklang Canal erupt. So I suggest that to ask when the Baklang Canal erupts is not to look for the Baklang Canal in specific sites, but to be attuned to the moment in which they might appear, how they choose to appear, and what they signal in their appearance, or perhaps even disappearance. For the purpose of this chapter, I attempt to map how the Baklang Canals, through their spatial temporal productions, escape, navigate, and mess with the present juncture a period of the Philippine nation state's sexual exceptionalism. 
And sexual exceptionalism operates via the reproduction of normative queer subjects by regulating social scripts and character formations of acceptability and respectability. So to, to contextualize this, I'll give an example of Pura Luca Vega's case. Um, so alternative drag artist Pura Luca Vega received Catholic backlash from so-called Christian groups and lawmakers from both Senate, Congress, and the publics after their video performing as Jesus the Nazarene using an anime rock version of the gospel song of the gospel song Papuri sa Dios and Ama namin sumasalangit ka went viral on social media. So when the video went viral, Congresswoman Geraldine Roman, the first Filipina trans-Filipina lawmaker, was quick to reprimand Luca for allegedly setting back the decades-long struggle for the said anti-discrimination bill. Alongside them were the many lawmakers and publics who lambasted Luca for offending their fragile religious feelings. Eventually, this offense taken against Luca was brought to the courts, incriminating Luca citing Section 133 of the revised Penal Code of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, which states that acts offensive to the feelings of the faithful is incriminating. Now, despite attending many of these court trials in drag, they were still unjustly detained after they allegedly failed to make a court trial, which they had already requested to be reopened. It is in this context, it is in this context that, uh, um, sorry, this is a work in progress. <laughs> and my sentence is not sentencing. <laughs> but it, it is in this context that one may find rootedness, uh, we may find rootedness in this context from Spanish colonization to the racial sexual governance of the American empire in Philippine soil. Um, so one instance, some instances of this is the annihilation of gender crossing shamans by the Catholic Church as evidenced by the colonial archives um, and also the anti vagrancy laws at the time of the American colonial period. Now this is the context that the Baklan Canal navigates in the everyday, the regime of sexual exceptionalism. So my claim is that the Baklan Canal's project of making might reach out to an elsewhere that is both no longer and not yet. And the way they reach out to and elsewhere is to unmake the here and now. Now this unmaking and unmaking is also parallel with my conceptualization of the bakla as a performative idiom. Following Martin Manalansan IV, the bakla's worlding, or more specifically, to bakla a, life, a particular life world, implies that we mess with, we cause disorder, and we disrupt. Now, understand this disruption as a disruption to the regime of sexual exceptionalism of the Philippine nation state, alongside surveillance, amidst policing, and against brutality. The Baklan Canal creates spaces, albeit ephemeral, to make present a yearning for the no longer and the not yet. Borrowing from Saidiya Hartman and Tavian Nyongo, I suggest that to Bakla, as the Baklan Canal does, can be understood via fabulation. So my understanding of Baklan Canal fabulation acts as a necessary corrective through blurring the coloniality of time and creating spaces of incompossibilities. As a critical modality of being in the world, Baklan Canal fabulation creates and dismantles worlds at the same time. It is an ongoing projection. It is an ongoing project of assertion. And for the Baklan Canal, via, via their spatial, temp, uh, spatial temporal productions, they are always in transit. So for the next following slides, I will read an excerpt from my close reading, um, one from Bruhas and another from Maglublo. So if I leave some context, pardon me, uh, please ask questions by the end of the presentation. Um, Bruhas. <laughs> So Brujas, a play by Carlo Paolo Pacolor, revolves around the narrative of four witches on the run. They are the nurse tapar, the worker at an orphanage, Fulangan, the lumpen, India, and the pagan, Sabino. The play blurs spatial and temporal boundaries by vaguely characterizing the milieu as simply a city torn from war. Its performance, however, produces the spatial and temporal context of the play. Now, the play was performed as a traveling performance across Metro Manila, 
Some of them were uh, is on your screen now at the New York Gallery, Quago Bookshop, UPM, UP Manila Museum of the History of Ideas, Canto Gallery in Makati, Vargas Museum, Project 20, Ishmael Bernal Gallery, UP Film Center, Catch 272. Um, now, these now these different spaces served as um, the stage of Brujas transforming Metro Manila as the city torn from war. Now this play is also loosely based from Isabella de los Reyes' El Diablo, a satire of Catholicism was told through a conversation between Catholic devotee Gat Maitan and Isabella himself, who portrays the pagan who believes in superstitions. And these superstitions were lifted from colonial archives, but often acts as Isabella's critical fabulation of the archives himself in the similar way that Hartman writes for critical historiography. Pacolor draws these connections in Brujas by blurring the temporal registers of what was then, what might be, what happened then, and what is now by locating these multiple, ref multiple reference of temporality into what I will call as a co-presencing here and now. So for context, I will also refer to the gender crossing shaman by her name and location. I will use Catalonan to mean the pre-colonial gender crossing shaman in the Tagalog regions. She appears elsewhere as her sisters, the Bailan, the Asog, and the Mambuki, and many others. She also has her woman counterpart, the Visayan Babaylan, and many others across the archipelago. Now, this is a move to, refu to refuse monolithic constructions and nationalized figurations of the gender crossing shaman in pre colonial Philippines. So, my claim is that the Baklancanal fabulation of Brujas places the Baklancanal as a Bruja, an embodiment of the gender crossing shaman who was hailed by the Spanish friars and missionaries as a Bruja. No more on this later. So Carla gestures a decolonial move through uh, their dramatic devices by making visible the colonial wound that the context by making visible the colonial wound that the context of the here and now is perhaps a continuing relations with colonial and imperial domination. So I direct my close reading now to the events unfolding from the moment of sacrifice within the play text. Yes. So the four witches, Tapara, Fulangan, India, and Sabino, now come together to enact the Maganito, a ritualistic sacrifice, driven by the goal of putting a stop to the impunity and brutality of their surroundings. Now these sacrifices make reference to the early colonial sacrifices performed by gender-crossing shamans in the Tagalog regions of the Philippine archipelago. They are, however, read by the Spanish friars via the grain of Catholic Christian lens of morality. Pedro Quirino in, Re in Re Relacion describes the sacrifice as, I quote, this pagan priest, while offering his infamous sacrifices, was possessed by the devil, end of quote. Similarly, Caspar de San Agustin describes, it as, describes them as, I quote, deceived by the devil. Now, in both of these colonial accounts, Spanish friars demonize the acts of gender-crossing shamans and situates them in the dehumanized supernatural figure of the devil. I assert that Carlos' use of the sacrifice is, will be a reparative reading and reenactment against the colonial archive. The Baklancanal fabulation here becomes invoked as an act that counteracts colonial modes of perceiving the gendered other. By bringing the sacrifice to the here and now in the Baklancanal's fashion, Carlo attempts to redignify the practice of Maganito. So before uh, to narrate what will happen by the end of the play, the four witches on the run meet on top of an orphanage in the city where the sacrifice requiring, requiring death is bound to be enacted. Sabino, who initiated the sacrifice, was betrayed by Tapar and Fulang, provoking him to kill himself. Upon realization, India declares, Ayoko na mga kwento. Ayoko na kasaysayan. Provoked by Tapar. Now Sabino aims, um, aims to get his sword, but before he even gets to do so, India grabs her sword and slays Sabino. She kisses him and eventually kills herself. The church bells ring. The, the ringing of the church bells have been replaced, now replaced by police sirens. Amidst the increasing sound of sirens, Fulangan announced, the show is finished. Sabino and Tapar is still alive. And now Sabino echoes Fulangan, the show is finished. Tapar intervenes, 
saying that Sabina and India may have died in the performance, but they are both still alive. The sirens are still on. Woo, woo, woo. Brutality is still amidst their surroundings. Fulangan asserts that they need to face this brutality. We have to face this brutality. While well, India declares, I quote, in the images taken from the ethnographies of the Americans, one finds the scowling eyes of the mujer indigena, the novel sauvage. Find us and, you'll, and you shall see us in the streets. That's us with scowling eyes. End of quote. The play ends. Now the turn of events imply that the sacrifice is only a show. It makes visible the very colonial tactic of divide and conquer. The parent Fulang and the gender crossing shamans who appeared in Isabella de la El Diablo as well, and in the, friar, in the Spanish friars accounts. Um, so they're both, um, the parent of Fulang are actual characters from archives. They betray Sabino and India, um, period, <laughs> who are the embodiments of individuals rendered as, as pagans, as brujas. So in the same way, the reinforcement of this as a betrayal also reinforces the colonial archive, that the gender-crossing shamans had left their peoples to their colonial masters, for they had failed and abandoned them. In breaking this temporality and invoking that the show has ended, but the performance has not, Carlo uses a dramatic device that indicates that there is perhaps no show, no performance. So what um. Carlo is doing here is presencing um, the no longer in the here and now, but reading it against the colonial archive um, by blurring what is a show, what's not, by, and also by saying that there is not really a show. But what Carlo is truly recognizing here is the colonial wound as an act of a necessary corrective to the violences of coloniality. Um, in, in other moments in, in the play, Carlo also destabilizes the words of the San Agustin and Carino and other Spanish friars who wrote and demonized the figures of, of the Baklan, of, of um, gender crossing shamans via the body of the Baklan Canal. So in many instances, Carla gestures the multiple embodiments of the Baklan Canal as the Bakla who have been victimized by the colonial and the modern states. In the words of Pulangan, sometimes I am those whose face is plunged in the toilet. In the words of India, I am the dress-wearing, um, cross-dressing bearded man whom you want to beat with a bottle of beer. In the words of Tapar, I am the one with the face you covered with masking tape and thrown into the dump site with a banner, Wag Tularan. In the words of Sabino, I am the parlorista whom you almost ran over. In these words of the four witches, Carlo refers to Jennifer Laude, Floyd Scott Churanko, the victims of Duterte's drug war, and the parlorista who is often the object of violence and hatred by macho, pa by macho patriarchs. The Baklan Canals are those bodies at the receiving end of violence from the sexual exceptionalism of the nation state, but also of the Spanish friars at the age of colonization. They are still the babaylan fed to the crocodiles. It is in this valence that I argue that what the Baklan Canals are reclaiming via brujas are there acts of worlding that have been policed and continue to be regulated by the rhetorics of sexual exceptionalism, um, like the Maganito, the sacrifice, enacted by, um, yeah, here it is, sorry. Um, so by insisting on their presence across the city, they confront the brutality of their surrounds. And I want to echo India now, that if you see them, us in the streets, hither, because that's us with scowling eyes. So now I'll move to um, the reading of Magluglob. Um, and this is in the middle of that section of the chapter. So there's a lot of uh, missing context, but Magluglob is a film um, that's, as I mentioned earlier, that it was filmed during COVID-19. So in the time of social isolation, um, some, some of the themes in this film includes grief. Um, it plays with absence and presence. And that's what I will focus on in this reading as well. So in a scene mid-film, Sunshine and Frenna are seen playing with makeup. Sunshine is painting Frenna's face with a deep blue eye shadow that frames their eyes in a circle, as if resembling a ghost, something which Frenna also remarked, mukhasang multo. Sunshine responded that it's fine for Frenna to look like a ghost so that they will only enter the coffin after they have their makeup done. So now they both reveal their faces in the mirror. 
The scene cuts to Frenna facing the mirror alone without makeup, as if the earlier scene was a mere memory, as if implying that one of them had become a ghost. This scene confronts the elite gay, the elitist gaze towards the Baklang Canal that deems them as anachronistic figure of global modernity, something which we might find in Bobby Benedicto, in Bobby Benedicto's work. Robert Diaz was quick to denounce Bobby's words by saying that Kabaklaan is not dead. However, here we find two Baklang Canals refusing to take death seriously, not until one is gone but perhaps they're pointing to the brutalities in the world amidst their joyful practices. The Sunshine and Frenna interject with both Benedicto and Diaz by saying and proclaiming, they want to see Kabaklaan as the Baklang Canal dead. The absence of sunshine and presence of Frenna appears again in Babylonic fashion as a reminder that the Philippine nation state's sexual exemptionalism wants to see Kabaklaan in its canal sensibilities and forms dead eradicated from the polite and centralized society they work to foreground. The film transitions to a new sequence, Paso, or flower pot. Sunshine and Frenna is seen taking a bath in the pozo, or a pump connected to a well, and they're seen enjoying the mundane joy um, that one experiences in the ordinariness of bathing. Sunshine narrates. A new way, I, this is a translation, um, a new way of tidying up that's not sweeping, bathing. We'll just bathe on the river that I, I'll, I'll be painting, and we'll frolic under the poking rays of the sun. This will suffice as the waves for now, strokes of paintbrush, rhythm of the hands, scrub, scrub, scrub. If only I had a river in my pocket. For the first time in the film, we find Sunshine and Frenna performing the film's title, The Act of Paglulublog. Here we see Paglulublog um, as bathing, but more so, I assert, as something indicative of what the Baklang Canal claims. Paglulublog becomes a new way of sanitation that is not sweeping, where sweeping is to throw away the dirt and eradicate the unwanted, bathing is to make wet, to make one feel the rage of water, to be entangled with it, to be enmeshed, now they take the act of cleaning and tidying up away from its modern colonial deployment, sanitation, for it is the language of the colonial masters and the rhetoric of the Philippine nation states, sexual exceptionalism. For the Paklang Canal, Paglulublob is to be one with, to be alongside, to wade through the river and move through and with others. They signal Paglulublob as an anti-colonial project that is still sanitation, but not eradication. It is healing. As it suggests, the anti-colonial temporality of Paglulublog is to experience mundanity, the unremarkable, amidst the brutality of their surrounds. It is to move amidst stuckedness, to refuse stuckedness by insisting one's desire for stasis and acting upon it through moving. Now, Stefano Harvey and Fred Motor remind us that the self-defense of colonial modernity is to fabulate the false image of enclosure. But the politics of minoritarian subjects is to resist, resist these enclosures, to make porous the boundaries of when we might be made canal and feel canal. Paglulublub then becomes a political project of um, counterfabulation, a Baklang Canal fabulation that is a reparative to the rigidities and borders that constrict them. They choose to become rivers that flow ragingly, albeit at the instance of enacting, they might remain enclosed in the mangkok, the bowl, like Frenna and Sunshine, who encloses themselves in the Palangana, but sometimes move out, move in, breathe through the raging water that enmeshes them. Now, the um, Sunshine and Frenna performs and fabulates something that hopes to dismantle the enclosures of this mangkok nonetheless. And it did. At the next sequence, we see them up, um, at the next sequence, Sunshine was confronted by a broken flower pot. So the Baklang Canal persists, persistently asserts and confronts um, through their presence. And in this process, they perform an undoing of what has made the flower pot rigid, bordered. In their doing and undoing, they bring the horizon of the not yet into the here and now. The enclosure is gone, even in glimpses. And, but ultimately, these glimpses will crack the rigidities wide open. In the words of Frenna, the time will come that I we will not have to confine ourselves here. 
and it will have to be shattered so that rivers, seas, and creeks run free. We will emanate and rage in the breadth of streets and its margins. So by way of conclusion, this is also not a conclusion. I don't know why I made this my conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> It is obvious to argue that both Brujas and Magluglub issue a call for the Baklangkana to start acting upon the violences surrounding them. But instead, I will assert as a final note that they both highlight the importance of the Baklangkana's being canal, of living the canal. In doing so, they, accom they accommodate themselves in the milieu that has always operated towards their eradication. Being canal is resistance to the regime of the Philippine nation state's sexual exceptionalism. And being canal is also an assertion that the Baklang Canal has been made canal. And in being canal, they fabulate worlds. Baklang Canal's temporal productions are thus fabulations that are in the here and now, but act as the co presencing of the no longer and the not yet, in hopes to cause ruptures in the enclosures that border them that borders them, full stop. Now allow me to land where I began, but perhaps the question, when does the Baklang Canal, Baklang Canal erupt, is not a question that demands an answer. It is an assertion to let the world be a Baklang Canal world, and we are just living in it. Yeah, a big round of applause. Maraming maraming salamat, Ian, that was so wonderful uh, lecture. So we now open the floor for questions from both our in-person and online participants. Again, a uh, reminder to our online participants, you may use the raise hand function or the chat function of Zoom to ask your questions. Okay, so um, it looks like Ms. Ethel has a question. Um, Ethel, you may now unmute. Uh, Hi. Your Hello. Congratulations, uh, Miss Universe and Miss World. Yes. <laughs> Mamili na lang kayo, who's who? Bala na kayo mag-away, magsabunutan. Um, <laughs> so, importanteng tanong kay Ian. Nasa na ang sisig? <laughs> No, no, no. Totoo na. Seryoso na. So, um... Sorry. Um, I find it intriguing the title of the play that despite the seriousness of the theme or the topic, it it's more on... It's it's funny, bordering on kind of ridiculous. Um, I'm curious to know if you have seen parallels of these in other creative works? And if so, what's your take on that? Why use, you know, um, funny titles when the topics are really heavy and for some confronting? I thank you. <laughs> thank, you thank you for, for the wonderful, wonderful question. question. I really proud it all. I believe basketball players. Sa uh, I believe I believe si Gemma. Ayun. <laughs> um. Thank you, Miss Ethel. Nakalimutan ko na yung tanong pero parang may sagot naman ako. <laughs> Ayun po. Um. I think this thing ang magtatagalog kasi hindi ko na kaya mag English. I think this thing ang laro. Um, although you can translate Laro as queer play, I still find it as a decolonial English term. I still find it as as, as a decolonial um performative ng bakla. Kasi mahilig maglaro ang bakla. Eh. Pag ginamit din yung laro, iba rin yung deployment niya sa um sa colloquial. So yung paggamit ng um ng mga nakakatawa or funny na mga titles, I think is one form of of that paglalaro na mga bakla lang din yung nakakaintindi. I think iko-quote ko rin si Carlo dito na may sinabi siya sa handbook ng mga bakla sa napipintong pagtatapos ng daigdig na may tunog na ang bakla lang ang nakakarinig. And I think yung laro is one instance of that um 
performative or frequency na mga bakla lang yung nagkakaintindihan. And and that's um that's manifesting a decolonial queer queer possibility, one that escapes translation, um that refuses to be contained and closed, um malaya at mapagpalaya. So yun yung um tingin ko sa laro at yun yung ginagamit na na moda nitong mga creatives na ito kaya nakakatawa o mahirap i-make sense kung ano ba yung gusto nila talaga um, ipakita. Kasi um, I think distinctly bakla din ito dahil wala pa ako nakikita ang um, similar creative works dito sa West, uh, sa Australia in particular or elsewhere um, in the so-called global north. Kasi very na reject nga ang grant ko ngayon Miss Ethel eh, dahil nilalaro ko sila, di ba? <laughs> yung grant application ko ay nilaro-laro ko, wala, hindi siya nag-work. So, ayun, parang mas tinanggap ulit nila yung mga madaling intindihin na nasa ano na nila, nakasanayang vocabulary. So, ayun. Maraming salamat. And I, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ian. Um Miss Ethel, you have any other questions or? Wala na po. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Award. So, our in person participants, any questions to any of our presenters? Yes, Alex. I have a question for Maxine. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, in the extent to which you studied it in the research, but I mean, whether you can talk about the tension between the the need to decarbonize the housing sector and heritage history. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you mean to that Yeah, I think, um, well, in the research context, yeah, I, I don't think na parang it it encapsulates good. But yeah, I, uh, parang in terms of the issues, that's definitely one of the big things to consider. Because like, Yun, kasi like when you renovate, diba parang maraming magbabago din sa heritage homes. So that's like a key issue to consider as well. Then I think also, of course, there's also, expanding on that, there's also the issue between uh, the need to decarbonize, but what about the, how it, like the social impact, right? Like you can't just like just tell people that, oh, sige, you do all of this. But then like, um, let's say they can't afford to change, right? So that's also like, um, one of the key issues that should be looked into when looking at decarbonization strategies. You know, in, in my in my case, it's just more of let's say looking at in uh what how the social economic would influence, like what would the outcomes be. But in terms of the action to uh, manage that, that would also require like, you know, more interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. So I think that also it, you know, um expands that sustainability, low carbon stuff. It's not just it's not just in STEM. It's not just it's a holistic uh, effort. And I think that's that's more of what we need right now, more of like interdisciplinary works for uh, sustainability. Because like, you know, people are not just numbers, but sometimes like system, it's like it seems that we hyper focus so much on oh reduction, reduction. But then people just because, yeah, but then people are just like, oh, these numbers, right? But then like it shouldn't be like that because like of course for all of us, you know, um like in the context context of energy, we all use energy. So we all have to kind of look at our own contextualized ways on how to manage this and hopefully have an aggregated effort for reach the targets while maintaining livability and living within planetary boundaries. Okay, thank, thank you, Maxine. So I was about to ask the same question. Yes, yes. <laughs> the, how did it relate to the Extra tanong. Kasi di ba sa Unimel, kikibain din yung mga building. Yes, yes. So ano yung say mo doon? Kasi like... Hanggang doon lang, Miss Max, hanggang doon lang yung talo. Doon rin na yung engineering brain. I think it depends on ano yung... Kasi like, let's say for example, pag giniba, right? So, uh, demolition also incurs in 
carbon emissions as well. So I think in the uh, looking at the whole life cycle, it's not as significant figure as let's say when you build a new house, but then or a new building. But then it also incurs some emissions. But at the same time, it depends on a new building na ba. So there's also the idea of repurposing as well. So like mm -hmm. since like right because I think uh, an aftermath of the COVID pandemic, like a lot of offices are being again changed into residential so like um, that's also one aspect that can be looked into like if you if you repurpose this building for like in the housing context no so like you would um, have more space for homes so you don't have to build as much so at the same time you can you don't consume as much so going back at I think the one of the key principles of sustainability which is actually reduction because usually it's like in sustainability it's like we go so um they always focus on oh it's recycle let's recycle you know but then actually important in yung reduction but of course reduction not to the point na ginigipit mo yung you know needs of uh, people but you know like you like when you look at the hierarchy of strategy or you reduce first and then you reduce yung impact of what you can do then if not then you can repurpose and then recycle and those things. That's okay. It. Thank you, uh, Max. Thank you, Ian. So, um, uh, Assistant Professor Samuel Cabot is raising his hand. Hi, hi, Sam. Thank you for joining us today. So, Hello, buong buo na naman. Pati yung title. Uh, yeah. Salamat, Dondi. Uh, um, yung question ko is kay Ian. No? Um, uh, hindi ko sure kung na, nasa ibang chapter mo siya or if naka-explain din ba sa methodology mo. Pero what do you make sense of yung paggamit nung, yung, nga, yung baklang kanal, um, aesthetic persona, whatever, dun sa, no, sa notion ng place na aminin natin na medyo middle class and above yung, yung space mismo. No, yung paggamit um, nung, um, you know, Wala, hindi naman hindi pinupuntahan naman niya ng mga ng those no na hindi part ng ganung circle so what do you make sense of that in lang thanks ah maraming salamat sir Sam at sa pagdalot si sir Sam po ay prof ko ng social <laughs> i feel blessed hindi <laughs> ako just ko um actually next chapter kung isusulat yung ano yung kanal aesthetic so maraming salamat sa question na yun. na force niya na akong mag-isip <laughs> sorry na ba kung next um ay ang to preface mo na yung response ko kasi ang um yung conceptual framework ko din po ng kung paano ko intindihin yung baklang kan yung kung paano ko na intindihan ang baklang kanal ay bilang hindi din siya enclosed na identity parang bakla din nga it escapes characterization nga so sanga-sanga siya so hindi na um di ba nung nung debates nung twitter ang ang awayan ay may mga real world baklang kanal may mga online baklang kanal and yung sa article niyo rin po ni sir um Christian Benitez ang argument is yung online baklang kanal ay they operate in a different milieu compared doon sa mga um, kilala na nating kanal which is yung mga parlorista, um, mga kontesera, etc. Um, sa framework ko naman po, pinagsasama ko sila. Sanga-sanga sila. Hindi sila um, hiwa-hiwalay, kundi um, may mga mundo silang nagtatagpo sila. So very delusion nga na assemblage na May mga mundong nagtatagpo sila at nagtutunggali sila. May mga mundong sama-sama silang sumasayaw. Mga ganun. So, sa tanong ng kanal aesthetic, ganun ko din siya nakikita. Kung um, ilalapat natin siya in a Western context, the closest siguro that we can think of is negative aesthetic. Pero walang dignidad yung negative aesthetic eh. Bin, binabalik kasi ng bakla yung dignidad sa kung ano yung mga huwi nalang hiya. Ganun ko siya nakikita. Parang kanal na nabasura ng tingin. Um, doon na tinatapon lahat. Yun na ang sinisisi. Yun na ang sinisisi ng tao kung ba't nababaha. Binubuhay ulit ng bakla yun. In the same way, ganun ko nakikita yung um, spatio-temporal productions ng mga baklang kanal sa, um, sa tao sa tao. Um, halimbawa, nung Miss Gay Piggery, 
yung community na yon nag-exist lang siya late 2010s na, mga 2015, 2016. Ngayon yung mga baklang community, yung mga komunidad ng mga bakla sa QC, um, nagko-contest sila, nagpa-pageant sila ngayon sa sa ano, sa Pigiri sa may UP Arboretum para buhayin yung community. Kasi pinunta um, pinuntahan ko siya, first time ko makapunta sa looban na yun. Sobrang layo niyo nilakad ko, tinabol-habol ako mga aso. <laughs> <laughs> Dahil nasa likod pa siya ng nursery, nasa likod pa siya ng techno hub. Pero ayun, ang daming tao talagang nagpunta. Hindi lang yung mga mismong nasa community ng Pigiri, kundi yung mga nasa katabi ng community din niya. Yung iba pa nga mga taga-Filcoa, tumatawid pa, um, tumatawid pa sila ng Filcoa, ganyan. So, yun ang power ng baklaan. Bumuhay ng mga, winalang, ng mga ano, kinalimutan. Ganon, parang dirty kitchen lang din. Very, 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 very middle class na binuhay din ng mga um, queers, quote-unquote, loosely. Dahil hindi lang naman lahat bakla. Hindi lahat na nag-occupy ng um, dirty kitchen ay bakla. Kumbaga, binuhay din ng elephant party, yung isang abandonadong restaurant. Binigyan niya ng buhay, ginawa niyang nightclub ulit. So, ganon ko nakikita yung spatio-temporal productions ng bakla. At yung kanal aesthetic, um, hindi siya negative aesthetic lang dahil nagbabalik siya ulit ng dignidad sa sa tingin natin dugyot na, basura na, um, wala ng kwenta, madumi, maasim, lahat ng mga mga negative um, mga words na may negative associations. Um, yun yung ginagawa niya. So again, um, performative ito na. Hindi siya to characterize what is a kanal aesthetic but rather anong ginagawa ng bakla doon sa um, kanal aesthetic na yun. Paano niya ginagamit? yung kanal aesthetic. And I see Sasa Girl, Pipay Kipay, and Ate Dick for image making yung purpose ng kanal aesthetic. Ito yung pagbababa sa masa na ito kami, tanggapin nyo kami. Although it makes um, kanal aesthetic packageable, marketable, again, in the logic of the free market, ginagamit to commodify the kanal. Um, pero ang... ang ang pagkakanal na ginagawa pa rin nila doon, yung pagbabalik nila ng dignidad is uh, ginagamit nila ito para ipaintindi sa masa na ito kami. Although, hindi mo rin, hindi rin natin masasabi na successful yun dahil kinakahon niya ulit ang bakla sa kanal na lang. Na eh, lumaya na rin tayo doon. Eh, na malaw, mas malawak na nga yung paningin ng bakla. Hypothetically, diba? Pero dahil sa image making nila na yun, nakakanal ulit. Ay, naka, nakakahon. Alam, naghalo na. <laughs> nakakahon ulit yung kanal as katawa-tawa. So, ganon. Although, ayun nga, may image making nila yun. Kanal aesthetic din yung misgay pang kalawakan. Kakaiba siya dahil hindi ito yung contest na nakikita natin na nag, nagpapaganda sila lahat. Dito kung sino ang pinakasalahula. Siya ang winner. So, kung sino ang tuma, tumatalon ng basketball, yeah. ng ring ng basketball, <laughs> at bababa na naka-split, siya ang winner. Kung sino yung pinakamukhang tanga, siya yung winner. So nag, may valuation naman din yung kanal dun sa community. Pero again, pagkakahon nga na siya na katawa-tawa lang kami. So, hindi kinahanap ko pa yung moments na bumabalik ang dignidad sa kanal aesthetic. Dahil bumabalik pa rin ako sa ah, nakakahon, nakakahon. So again in the glimpses, diba? Asan yung ruptures in the glimpses of um redignifying um what's been made canal. Ayun po. Sana nasagot ko po yung tanong ni Sir Sam. And I thank you. <laughs> thank you, Ian. Do you have any follow-up questions, Sam or Ah, uh, siguro ano lang uh, uh, ang siguro pagsipa mo na lang yung yung uh, in notion nga, di ba, nakakahod nga siya and all, and parang walang disruption. Kaya para meron ding notion ng, hindi ko lang kung discrepancy ba yung tamang term or parang, yun nga, na ginagamit siya sa play, sa isang artistic place na not necessarily link dun sa, sa ano ba talaga yung milieu nung no community. So, yun. Baka yun na lang yung pwede mong idagdag sa sa kuda. Ayan. Thank you, Ian. Sa susunod na chapter ko po yung ekonomi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry naman. Advance ka pala. Okay. Thank you po, Sir Sam. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Sam. Sam's also doing his PhD no, sa Hong Kong right now. Ah, 
Ah, uh, yes. Nandito ako sa land ng dim sum. Hello sa inyo. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, from the land of hello, love, goodbye. Uh-oh. Thank you. Okay. Um. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Kat. My question now, my mom. So, in fact, you could start going to the data part. Pero, I'm just curious na po, di ba po yung users mo, I think it's one question um uh, no because at the moment because uh siguro in process like the pag ano ng research right now kasi parang mas uh, exploratory at the moment yung sa health food side but then like i i, I would say that yeah yung sa industry aspect yung materials talaga is a very a significant component compared to let's say even just the operating so that would really have a good impact like looking into embodied carbon in terms of building new homes like uh, what type of materials you're going on in processes um greening the processes of manufacturing so more of industry playing you know? but I, I would say as well like because uh, there's a significant impact then based on let's say the socioeconomic economic attributes like for income or for the type of household then looking at maybe environmental preferences as well because like let's say on um on assumption right like let's say younger younger households may have more environmental interest so they may like the invest put more of like uh, investment on oh maybe we can change uh we can um make their homes more sustainable or something like that depending on their income as well so i think i, I would say like um super, nothing super conclusive at the moment but i would think that let's say if me um uh, a policy on yeah subsidized subsidization or something like that that could also um uh, have some significant strike as well but at the moment yung mas masasabi ko is more of the industry side uh, so like i think as well like um one of the key arguments is like oh why do we put everything on the household on the consumer because we're but limited lang yung um capabilities but in a sense it's more of like a synergization of uh let's say, into the uh, role of the industry, but then we're in this context, it's more a settings that they would follow like government policy. And then what, because like households would be like uh, considered as agents, so parang mas pre-thinking like what to, how they're going to use their energy, things like that. So it's just more of like looking at how that occurs and then how that uh, impacts carbon emissions and how, let's say maybe, government policies can influence that but then like uh, at the same time since you can see that the, the um the granularity of the uh, the framework or uh, maybe like let's say an aggregated effort of of households can leverage policy as well so more um things like that can be seen <laughs> thanks yeah thank, thank you maxine thank you pat uh, any other questions Again, malamang salamat, Maxine. Um, it, it, it's it's a whole new world for me, but yeah, I I I appreciate the director. Um, I really appreciate how you reference don sa pre-colonial uh Catalonian the Bailan the the uh gender crossing shaman no and so so you you question ko is so you use the term the back of presencing to pertain don sa don sa mga close reading no na na ginamit mo na play so madali lang naman itong question kasi na hindi pa natin actually napag-uusapan sa mga chikahan natin but can, can you consider that th- those plays also as uh, Although mas modern yung reference nila dun sa mga diba, victims ng, uh, ng, ng sexual regime nung, nung 
no current uh, modern state masasabi mo ba na uri ito ng memorialization din no uh, mga pre-colonial babayanan since maraming references din talaga sa kanila yung sa brujas yeah brujas mm. Pa, ang nakit nung una ko kasi nabasa yung bros. Honestly po, kapag binasa niyo sa text, hindi niyo talaga siya maintindihan kasi hindi ko siya naintindihan. <laughs> <laughs> Tapos hindi ko rin siya napanood. So meron lang akong mga photos and footages na sinare sa akin ni Carlo. Um, tapos may reading din siya sa YouTube. Tapos sa mga chika din namin ni Carlo, hmm, hindi niya rin nabanggit talaga actually na memorialization siya ng babaylan. Para sa nung finally na make sense ko na yung bruhas, nakita ko din siya as parang kung nilaro ni Isabella de los Reyes yung archives, nilaro din ni Carlos si Isabella de los Reyes. So naglaro-laro lang. Naglaro-laro lang. Sorry. <laughs> Ayun. So parang um, siguro hindi siya memorialization dahil tinutunggali niya yung archives. Yun nga. Yung sinasabi ko kanina na Um, dinadagdagan niya eh. Binabago niya kung ano ba yung sinasabi ng babaylan. Um, actually, may sinulat ako na hindi siya part ng thesis, pero work din siya ni Carlo. Tapos, um, babas, iaano ko na lang. Wait na, open ko lang ha. Yeah. Ayun. Um, si Carlo kasi, mahilig siya, mag, mahilig siya talaga laruin din yung ano eh. archives at laro in din ko ano yung um, present context. Tapos itong sinulat ko dito, ayun nga, nabanggit ko na rin kanina na um, ang gusto kasi ng ang gusto ng ang gusto ng mga frile, ang huling knowledge natin sa mga babaylan na inabando na tayo. Iniwan tayo. Kaya nga ang salita niya rin sa kay Isabella de los Reyes, di ba? Ang ating unang pagkakaibigan ay tapos na sapagkat darating dito ang ilang lalaking mapuputing bed of fab. <laughs> Ayun. Yun yung alam natin yung huling lingwahin niya. Pero kay Carlo Pacolor, nagkaroon ng bagong kuling salita ang mga bakula. Sabi niya, I quote, nasa kabila tayo, nasa malayo, at iba yung pampang. So, umalis sila, pero nasa malayo lang sila. Andito pa rin, kumakaway. O pwede sumasaya. Sinasayawan natin ng ating mga tugtog na ang frequency ay tayo lamang nakauunawa at humuhulma. Mga bakula lang ang nakakarinig. So, parang sa reading ko ng bruhas, ayun nga, reparative siya, um, corrective siya sa um, sa narrative na gustong gustong it, gusto ng mga ng mga um, frailes na i-digest natin. So, nilalaro siya at binabago siya ni, ni Carlo through bruhas. So, hindi siya memorialization. O hindi ko lang din siguro naiintindihan yung full extent ng memorialization. So, yeah, ayun. Ang pinagagaling, maraming salamat. Na-appreciate ko yung quest. Ay, yung, yung sagot mo. Pero ang pinagagaling ako kasi yung huling nag-serve tayo, di ba? Ang nagtanong ka naman sa akin, how perform, that, that performance is there. Kasi yan lang pala. Use as a uh, uh, force of memory sites, right? Kasi pwede sila na paraan. So parang, since hindi ko alam yung material, ano uh, talaga yung content nung no, no brumas, at marami kang references nung sa historical gabay na. So parang iniisip ko na, aside from yung reparative, ano na, may, meron, din pa, meron din kaya siyang Uh, ang gulo na baka uri din ito na to, to commemorate those historical figures. Kasi mm. yun yung pinagagaling ng question ko. But yeah, I, 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 I appreciate it. Mas that. ano, ayun, hindi ko, hindi, hindi kasi klaro sa barat mo. Mm. <laughs> ako naman, kasi ang sinulat ko rin actually sa thesis is, ang ginagawa ng bruhas ay, um, pinaparamdam niya ulit yung sugat ng mga babay na. Siguro in that way, it memorializes the pain. Mm-hmm. Pero hindi yung um, actual event. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ayun. Maraming salamat. Thank you po, Ms. Don. Okay. Great adversitation. <laughs> Are we ready to know? <laughs> Meron pa po ba? Carbon as waste yan, ma. Okay. Asa ka na. Actually, I have a question for the two of you, siguro. Kaya nang si, nag-wonder lang ako kung ano yung mga adjustments, for example, like, yung master's thesis mo sa mm-hmm. Philippines na pag-sasarya. And I'm just wondering kasi um, yung mag-try yung study ko what if I'm going to study Indonesia for example like comparative study. So I'm just wondering kung ano yung mga uh, example adjustments like difficulties particularly in studying the Philippines 
some actors are from other cities, but they're, I mean, they're pretty short and everything. Like, anyway, that was my name. No, uh, I know, like, it, it wasn't too. And the image shift was not too drastic because it was also very different. Right? It's like so in the Philippines, it was more another you know, like um particularly for socialized housing tenements. So parang since we had a database or anything at all, so uh we had to um you know um uh, you know observe like how panigin the energy. So parang it was really first hand um analysis. <laughs> And it was more focused like, on that. So like uh it was pretty different in that sense because it was it had more first hand um data gathering and you know learnings, first hand learnings. While in Australia, because they already have a database, let's say from the from the ABS and from you know other uh, construction databases now. So like it was it was less um personalized in that sense because the, the data is already there, then now it's just more more how to analyze that and how to kind of um, project those mm -hmm. things. So like, let's say um, in terms of your household uh, influence, they also have, they also conducted the big survey, not necessarily recently, but you know, it was very comprehensive. So they did it 10 years ago. And then it's just more of like tweaking settings and like, oh, I think maybe some, now we can uh, add more environmental preference. Let's say if you put it in a, quantitative modeling sense. So I think in that way, the new difference in my own experience, but since the Philippines, it's really hard to get data. No? <laughs> so, like, so like it was very, it was more um, personalized in a way. It was harder in that aspect in data gathering collection. And, but parang mas, mas, na, mas personalized siya. So I really appreciated na, ah, okay, ganito pala yun. So like, for example, when, <clears throat> When we, I was just talking to some of the residents, para ah yun pala yung uh, billing system pala sa sa tenements ay eh, prepaid. So it's like oh ah uh, so you para babayad na sila ng siguro a certain amount, then they'll just use that much sa energy. So para ah oh, it's very different because like like here para di ba usually it's like you use the energy then you get billed. Don it's like para sa text no to prepaid sila tapos oh, okay so you see the differences talaga in like especially, I guess, particularly in a socialized housing context. But then here, yun, I think it was more, more data driven and more mm -hmm. ano like a, um less personalized. Yun. <laughs> thank, thank you, Maxine. Uh, for the end, actually, um, yun, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing. 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 Part of the suburb or relevant to some questions done in the first place, or like you. Like, you know, Tabalik ko siya sa iyo. Sa ganun sa pageant. Pag di na alam yung sagot, ibabalik sa iyo. Kaya mo naramdaman hindi ka bakal. I think the vote ang kanap. Bakit pa pa sila sa iyo? Bilang ba? Okay. For example. Ah, <laughs> crown. <laughs> Ah, okay. Hindi kasi parang ay ang never ko naman silang nakita na kasi frena frena ko din yung mga karamihan dito, yung iba dito parang um kahit hindi ko sila frena parang barkada mo na sila agad at the moment na mag ano kayo magtagpo kayo parang sister kayo agad. So ganun din kapag pumupunta ako sa sa looban yung mga bakla na contest ganyan, parang sister mo rin sila agad maliban na lang kung iba yung handler nila. Pero ang point kasi is, hindi lang naman din sila baklang kanya. Marami rin silang version ng sarili nila. So, doon sa pagkakahon ng kung ano ang waste, no waste speaker lang sila, ganyan. Ayun, tao sila, Arvin. Diba? Una't una sa lahat, tao sila. Hindi, lang, hindi sila subjects, hindi sila research subjects, hindi sila objects of analysis. Tao sila. 
Yeah. Yun ang tinuro sa atin ng yun ang training natin. Eh. Naisipin na na subject sila, object sila. Tao sila, una sa lahat. At kadikit natin sila sa balat. Palagi mong sandalhin na rin. Kaya ayun nga, diba, para chika na lang to later. Pero pag nasa field kasi, ako din minsan nawawala na ako sa mindset na nag-field ako. Kasi naglalaro na lang ako talaga. Kasama sila. Ganun din. Yung mga moments na naglalaro ka na lang kasama sila. Kumakayang ka kasama sila. Namumulot ka ng baso. Yung mga gilig mo. Namumulot ang basura. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Yung mga moments na yun, in, in, in the glimpses, ando ng meaning. And their idea of Sorry, kasi the idea of the bagay lang is had so many iterations. Mm-hmm. And parang doon ang curious and second, sabi siya din sila, sa Ilambo Island, it's an island near Cebu, di ba? Mm-hmm. Meron ang ritual doon every, it's a performance every May, tinatawag nila is um, a celebration of the Phoenix. So yung mga tao, yung mga lalaki. Pwede namin yan. Punta namin. Punta namin. Punta namin. Punta namin. Punta namin. Punta namin. Punta Dress up with skirts. Tapos, yung mga bangka na sa store. Tapos may mga holes. Tapos, Uh-huh. Pinapasok nila doon yung ano. Meron din yun sa wet on weddings. Sorry me. Every Thursday. But that's fine. Pero sa mga 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 they call it mythology. And yung alam na yun, walang twist talaga ng mga pastation kasi they will really let drive away the twist after a month. Mm. So, parang i- kunas, tapos, yung bitcoin na yun, yung mga mga bukla, yung mga bayan sa Cebu, pupunta sa doon sa performance na yun, tapos they would like really dress, they, parang women, but not really women, drag, mm. tapos yung mga lalaki, parang ano din, masayaw sa 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 water. So, interesting siya na, parang, I, I just thought about it na parang, yung question ko talaga is, ano yung scope? Kasi you're talking about the film channel. Is language also part of that definition? Mm, I mean, uh, sa drafts ko din, I always reiterate na ang bakla ay Tagalog construction. Mm-hmm. Um, so, nakakulong ako sa mga sa mga areas na salit, sinasalita ang Tagalog. So, same sa baklang kanal, umabot ako ng, ng Laguna. Um, Ilocano na ang Baguio, pero may, daya, may, may diaspora din kasi ng mga taga-metro sa Baguio. Eh. Dinadala din kasi ng Elephant Party, yung party nila sa Baguio. So nagpunta din ako ng Baguio. Ayun. Um, siguro what I found is nagta-travel yung sensibilities niya. Hindi yung, minsan hindi na yung lingwa. Yung sensibilities ng pagkakanal. Parang nung nagpunta ako sa... Um, yung pinagpa-perform nila Deja sa Baguio. Naka- Planet G. Punta ko ng Planet G. Ang una ko talagang, ang una ko talagang perception ay Punta na parang rap, parang rapture, para ang dinala sa Cubao. Oo. Oh, and alam mo, meron. May ganun akong na-feed. Uh, Anthropologists actually studied this. Um, si Joel Canuday sa uh, Ateneo Park. At least dissertation. Nag-study siya ng mga, kasi, uh, okay, so yung mga sa Manila na mga ethnic apologies and dance, sabi nila, pangala is dead. But when we started to have to do, the ones that actually made it, like, you know, evolve are the bakla. So they would dance sa pangala, kasi normally hindi babae sa, oh, so makikita ko yun sa, you know, popular media, sa ano nila sa karaoke, yung makikita mo sabi yung mga bakal sa masayaw, but it's not something na parang, um, it's it's the, I don't want to say subculture, but the culture itself, the community itself is, you know, um, 
reproducing mm -hmm. the, the practice yeah. and it was an awesome study. Well, because when I was in Marawi during the siege, nasa naman sa me, so there was a corridor. Tapos, may meron kami kilala na na parlorista sa 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 Marawi. Pero ngayon, kailangan yung umalis sa corridor. Pero, hapa yung book niya, and she was really like, she was really happy. Tapos, kailangan yung depicted him as well. She had, she had to look, look nice to him so that when he passes the, the corridor, so sabi niya, ano mo ba? Sa mga icing. Pagdating ka talaga sa end, lalaki siya mo, ganun na siya. Pag this, ano, di ba nagkami, talagang bigla, tapos she made fun of everything that happened to her and everyone couldn't understand. Tapos ginawa niya talaga para performance pag, kasi she can't hurt her pagayang and that or so on. In every, every of her uh, no, performance, part yun sa amazing for me, healing niya, but it's also not her. Like, you know, it, her as a human being coping with her identity. So it's very interesting na nakulat niya sa memorialization kasi Ang tinipos sa memorialization is not something that's static, it's continuously like evolving and commemorating is actually um, an ongoing process for every identity identity or community. So, yun, yun lang comment ko. Mm, sal thank you for sharing. <laughs> yun din lang. Siguro ano sa pag pagbalik lang dun sa topic ng scope, baka kasi yung katawan din, di ba, spasya siya. So baklang ka na lika kahit saan ka magpunta. Hindi siya sa kung saan ka um, nakalugad. Parang mm -hmm. gano'n. So, a body as space. Okay. So they are being <laughs> it. <laughs> Baka, yun yung best. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Oh. Okay. Ipapaalala ko, ipapaalala ko na po na naka-record ko yung zone natin. Nakarecord nga pala tayo. Nagpapaalala. Tayo. I-upload ko natin. So, yeah. Parang may thinking na parang warrior yung mga kapatid na like they're writing or something. Kasi parang nalita ko yun siya sa research ko like sa case study ko, for example, like there's a news na tinitingnan yung mga waste paper as people Warriors. So I feel like tapos may nabasa ang reading na parang para sa separate case naman na parang yung mga waste paper ng Subarto for example parang so na, na refer sila sa branding them as environmental agents, as bigger environment. So parang ano yung patin dun parang sa tingin ko mas hindi nga ang balita talaga yung mga magkakulang sa nga dun sa yung sarili nila sabi na warrior or is this directly because is this something that we give them responsibility of even na parang we're just being we're just living we're just making a living or like mga ganong oh. the preface ang nagreclaim lang ay mga twitter walks um, da, la, halos lahat mga nakachika ko pag tinatanong ko nabasa niyo ba yung sa twitter ano lang ah um, parang probing lang hindi ko dinidiretso na ano tapos pag tinanong lang ano yung mga yung baklang kanal reclamation kanal kanal me wish nila wish nila knows talaga. Mm. Mm, hindi sila present sa mundo ng pag-reclaim ng bakalang kanan sa Twitter. So hindi ako yung naglagay din niyan. Um in, yung pag-impose ng social justice warrior, yung mga Twitter walk sa Twitter yun na ni-reclaim ko ano ang bakalang kanal. Na kanina nga sinabi ko na baka na ano din sila, na confront sila ng sarili nilang elitismo towards the lumpen bakla na ah, na ah, pangit din siguro yung paningin nila sa baklang kanal kaya sila na controversial hindi ko na po sasabihin sa recording later ko na lang <laughs> pero it has something to do with the LGBTQ plus politics as well oh. sa um, <laughs> nung na-adapt na siya I think nung na-adapt na siya sa mainstream na-reify siya talaga ng media Hmm. although ayun nga parang sa personal na level na lang ito hindi na theoretical pero sa personal na level ayoko namang um, ayoko namang sabihin na mali or pangit yung self-determination nito mga baklang to mm -hmm. na ginustong magpunta sa social media or sa mainstream media may sarili nilang self-determination yan eh um, 
Ako may issue ako kasi na re-define. Ako mo define na nila, nakahon na nila ulit. Um, pero ayun, siguro sa personal level, ang responsibility natin, ay, tayong mas mas may alam o <laughs> mas maalam siguro sa mga sa proseso ng lipunan. Pangit. Very pageant. Pero siguro tayong mga maalam ay ang responsibility natin is i-ano sila, i-correct sila, i-call out sila, na oy, na ano yan, na parang mali na yung magagawa niyan. Parang ganun lang. Pero on a theoretical level, syempre ansya tayo sa mga sa mga ganun ganap din nila. Ansyang. Si Arby po yung ansyang. Ansyang parang daot, ang mamaklamo. Minsan marikla, minsan mababaw lang siya na mariklamo, mainisin. Pero minsan mas malalim din siya na ganun na mas pero pag sinabi ansya na ako parang irita na ako mm. or ayo parang ganun siya in my context pero pwedeng iba ang gamit din ng ansya eh. alam nyo naman ang lingwa ng mga bakla sanga-sanga talaga siya yeah. Yeah. we're learning something mm. parang maasi yeah. diba? ayun maasi yeah. um, again reminder this is recorded <laughs> Uh, any follow-up questions for our speakers? Um, if, if not, then I'll formally end this certain dialogue. We congratulate you to Maxine and Ian. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, we hope to see you again soon in the next uh, CERN dialogue. Yeah. Um, may we request our remaining online participants if you can open your um camera, please. I for... stop the recording. Yeah, for for a photo op. Just na cancel, I mean. <laughs> Ara.